And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us all the way from Mythic Table, the co-founder of this little endeavor, the one, the one and only, the Mark Man himself, Mark Felice. How you doing Hi. tonight, man? Oh, good. Thanks, Mildred. Thank, thank you for thank you for braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the temple. <laughs> My pleasure. So, a bit of a, a bit of a tradition is that I have around here is opening with the humble beginnings. So. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Oh, uh, so I actually wrote a little bit about this on the Mythic Table website. Um, my first introduction to role-playing games was when I was in grade five. There was it was in a small school. We had three or four boys in the school. That was that was all of us. Sorry, in the class, mm -hmm. and um, we would sit in the back of the class and just goof off all day. And one of them had this red box with this dragon on the cover. And he'd be making up characters in the middle of class. So I asked him, like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm playing D&D. &D. Okay, well, can you show me how it works? Can I play it with you? And he's like, no, you can't play it with me. You don't know how to play. Anyway, I got my mom to pick me up the, the box. And uh, I uh, <laughs> literally played by myself for the first couple of months, just making up characters, going through the adventures that are in the box, or making up my own adventures, leveling up my dudes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was... Talk about humble beginning. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's how I started. That was... Ooh, since long time ago. Since you mentioned Redbox, I'm guessing it was um, Beck Me. Yes, it was the it was the basic set of original Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. So that was back when they put out the uh, the basic box, the expert box, the master's box, and all of those boxes, and there were different colors for the different things. Yep, um, I d it's one of those it's one of those things to clarify because whenever somebody says original D and D, I I always have to try and narrow it down because there's like four or five different variants. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. And this, I guess, wouldn't be the original original. This was the marketing scheme that they made after they kind of made a splash with their, their original original. Well, and they're like, how do we get this in the hands of, of kids? It ultimately depends on how anal retentive you want, you want to be about it. <laughs> like, if, like I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure... So I'm, I tend to be pretty loose with with the whole with the whole approach because the differences between between each of them is in the grand scheme of things very minimal. Mm -hmm. Um, and I leave I leave the I leave the pedantic for the grogs out there, which I'm not. Um, but moving moving past that, would it? What pro what prompted the creation of Mythic Table, and what were what did you what were you guys trying to create it in um, response to? Because art is a response to other art. Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. I like the way you phrase that too. Art is a definitely a response to other art, and I guess I guess around 2010 2012, I started playing more D and D after I'd been moving around for a lot. Um, so I'd gotten back into it. And when I got back into it, I started missing my friends from back home. So I started looking into ways we can play online, which led me to Fantasy Grounds and uh, D20 Pro and eventually to Roll20. Mm -hmm. And I played a lot of games on them. I still use Roll20 to, the, uh, to this day. Um, and I love my, I love what they've done for our hobby. It's, it's great stuff. Um, we were um, working at Skybox. Um, as contractors for 343, we were working on the Halo project. And there was a group of us, probably about maybe six or seven of us, who like to play D&D uh, &D at lunchtime and things like that. We're all sitting around waiting for builds to compile, complaining about life and work and Roll20 and things like that. And we're like, 
we could probably do a better job. And then it just spiraled out of control. Um, the truth is, what Roll20 has done is, is really fantastic. And it's a hard thing to do. Mm-hmm. Um, we came at it from the stance of, you know, the game industry and having access to a lot of um, UX uh, user experience designers and things like that. So we thought, oh, well, if we take it from a viewpoint of, of making a game and working on user experience and making sure that, you know, every moment and every, every aspect of the tool is memorable and usable, mm-hmm. it gets out of the way of the game so we can concentrate on what the fantasy of the game is, as opposed to spending a lot of time typing in the chat windows and going from one window to the next. So we had this pretty grand vision. Yep. Um, it's about two years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. Now, the approach that you the approach that you're taking is a more is unless I'm mistaken a more open source approach to virtual tabletop. Yes, yes. Originally, it was going to be a commercial project. We uh, we had put together a pitch to um, attempt to sell it to the founders of of uh, of uh, Skybox, um, but that kind of fell flat. Um, and Skybox released the IP to me, and then I turned around and opened it up. Um, I really wanted, I had, I really believed in the project. We had made some headway. We had some great ideas. The prototype was really interesting, um, and I liked some of the technical approaches that we were taking. Um, it had a really strong foundation to it, and I wanted to see it through. So when I got out of Skybox. Um, we had, we had already pitched in the idea of releasing an open source as a commercial project. And the numbers that we had looked at looked really great. So mm-hmm. when I got out of Skybox, I, um, I thought, well, I can do the same. I'll release it open source, make it nonprofit, and we'll see what we can do. Um, and it just started like a snowball going downhill. It started picking up more moment- momentum. Now... Given 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 that background that you mentioned, um, I think it's fair to assume that you've experimented in one form or another with a with a um, wide berth of um, of other virtual tabletops. So, I'd like to um, I'd like to I'd like to kind of do a bit of a lightning round, if you will, and I'll give I'll give you a name of a, of a virtual tabletop, and you t- tell me s- some of the things that you liked and didn't like about it, and. If it, if it was one of those that you did that you never tried out, we can we you can just say pass. Okay, so to be honest with you, I've been so busy lately that I haven't tried out a lot of the new ones that have come out. Uh, like uh, Foundry, I've used very briefly, yep. and Let's Roll, I haven't really played with at all. Um, but we can go through. We yeah, can give it so a shot. Not all not all of these are going to be strictly speaking new. So okay. I'll Good. so um. I'll start. I'll start with the big ass elephant in the room. Roll twenty. Mm-hmm. So, roll twenty was an inspiration to me because of its ease of access. Uh, you can get into roll twenty super easy. You can send a link to somebody super easy. You can use it from any computer. Um, you can go to work and use it. You can use it from home. You can, you know, you can be visiting your grandmother and use it from her computer if she has. Um, I loved it. Is fantastic. Um, I felt that um, there was a number of, you know, there's some performance issues with it uh, that are that are difficult. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the way that their character sheets are are open. So the character sheets that we use are mostly community created, and you can do a lot with JavaScript especially if you open it up for the type of character sheet modifications that they have. Mm -hmm. Um, So I love it. I think we can do better. Um, Fantasy Grounds. Fantasy Grounds is one of the first ones I tried. I'm like, okay, this has got all the features. This is great. I can can get into this. I, I think I tried three or four times to figure out how to use it. And... I gave up on each of them. I hate to say it. Um, those guys are, are doing some pretty great stuff. I love the fact that they're working. Their their integration with rule systems are, are is really tight. Um, I love that stuff. Um, but I just 
couldn't figure out in the early days, I couldn't figure out how to work with it very well. What I should have done is hopped on YouTube and checked out some tutorials and things like that, but I never did. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> D20 Pro. D20 Pro I love. Um, so back in the early days when I was looking at everything, D20 Pro was the first one that caught my uh, And it's it's really strange, too, because most people don't even know about D20 Pro. It's, it's not one of the hugely popular ones. Um, but I, I really, really liked it. I didn't like the fact that it was a client server architecture and that you needed to host it and configure your firewall for people to get through and things like that. That kind of, um, that kind of model is a little bit dated. Um, the, the things I liked about it were that, um, it integrated so well with Pathfinder in D and D. Um, it did such a great job. Um, it worked like the, the ability to, to manage time and manage buffs and things like that to automatically resolve combat. Uh, huge inspiration. Huge inspiration. And I hope to do something like that in Mythic Table eventually. Um, so think about it in the way of um, you're looking at a game like World of Warcraft and you have a number of buffs on your player or debuffs on your player. You can see them at a glance. You can see how long they're going to last for, things like that. Um, D20 Pro approached that. They were getting really, really close to being able to do that kind of thing. They had all the mechanics there. All of the modifiers and all of that stuff was already figured out and already working. So right. they, did, they were doing a great job. All right. Um, Astral. Astral, I tried a couple of times. I never actually played a game on it. Uh, but back when they launched, I, I went through the tutorial. I liked what they were doing. Um, I liked how simple um, their user interface was. Um, but I didn't get very far into it. So can't comment too much. All right. But they look very promising. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Foundry. Foundry looks great it really does um so i i guess it's built by um one individual morgan down um, just south of us in seattle or somewhere in oregon something like that um and he's done a great job fantastic job opening up the ability for the community to develop modules for it was a great idea and one of the greatest points of foundry from what i hear is all of this just vast expanse of modules that you can get for it uh, in different systems that you can plug into it. Mm -hmm. um, it has the same problem that D20 Pro has in that um, you need to set up, it's a client server kind of architecture. Mm -hmm. You can set it up for, uh, I mean, there's a hosted site, I believe, called uh, Forge VTT, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that's another subscription service. So in order to use that, you have to pay something like 4 or $5 a month. But I really like what they're doing. And it's very, very slick. I've heard that the user experience isn't great, but VTTs are very complicated, extremely complicated. So it's hard to do a good user experience. Yeah. Now, when it, com now, when it comes to... When it comes to some of the when it comes when it comes to the when it, come, when it came to the creation of Mythic Table, aside from the given that I mentioned the whole art responding to other art, um, aside from the open source um, aspect, which we already which we already dipped into, given what given your experiences with those other um, other ser other services, what were some of the pillars that you wanted to address with Mythic Table? So when we originally launched it as an open source and nonprofit, um, we, we kind of had to make a mission statement and a bunch of corporate values and silly stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I put a lot of thought into this at the time. I'm like, okay, so what, what, is, what is like the top three things that I would like to set Mythic Table apart? And I talked to this with uh, some of the team at the time as well. 
And we kind of decided on um, three things. Um, community being number one. So people, we call it, is our one of our core values. And that is um, making sure that we engage with, with our community so that they understand what we're doing, what we're trying to do. And we do it in a way that's... I like this. It's not just open. We do it in a way that's accessible. So it, on our Discord channel, anybody can can message me and say like, "Hey, Mark, I want us to do this. So I think we should do this." And I'll get they'll get a response from me within you know a, a couple of hours at most, mm -hmm. not a couple of minutes if I'm bored. Um, so we want to be extremely available to the community, um, and so far we've been able to accomplish the. Um, the next one, I believe, was um, the user experience. So we wanted the ease of use to be so great that it changes the way we play role-playing games. Um, so I've used this term a couple of times, like likening it to how the, the typewriter changed how we write, and then how the word pro processor changed that, and then how you know office suites have changed how we do that. So as technology evolves, we keep getting better and better at better tools at what we're doing. I want to do the same thing for tabletop RPGs. Right now, we're in the space of pen and paper, which is great. That's how we started. We love it. We know it. It's easy. That's all we really need. Why would we need anything else? And this is the same thing people said when the typewriter came in. Why do we need that? You know, this is, this is fine the way it is. It's funny. Um, it's funny you meant. It's funny you mentioned that kind of thing because I remember. I remember researching on on the whole think on the whole pattern of people ab adapt reacting to new technology, and I saw a really a really old newspaper article that was disparaging the idea of the cotton gin, which what the cotton gin. Yeah. What is a cotton gin? That was that was a that was a machine that was. I now keep in mind I am vastly simplifying this. The cotton gin was a machine that was that was you that was made to help that was made to help um exped, expedite the process between um the cotton that that got picked out in the fields to the to the material that would be utilized. In actual fa actual fabric work. Oh, I see. Makes sense. Um, it it was it's meant it's meant to separate the fibers from the seeds, which up until that point was done painstakingly by hand. And you're talking uh, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of of cotton plants and having to separate having to pick it and then and then get the seeds out manually. Um. There was a there was a couple other thing, um, eh, um, ripple effects that this kind of thing had. It's I I like to bring these kind of things up whenever whenever people lament about how about how um, technology is moving too fast or something like that, and uh, and I bring up this kind of thing and I say, people have said that exact same thing a century ago and two hundred years ago and three hundred years ago. Yeah. I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure if I I'm pretty sure if I was if I took a time machine I could find people complaining about these newfangled sundials. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Need that. Oh. <laughs> and yeah. And and oh, you've you I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that, I'm pretty sure at some point in time there was arguments about whether or not we should use we should use a solar or lunar calendar. Oh yeah. But. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that is that is one of the things that we're thinking about mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, virtual tabletop. Mm -hmm. We did, in our research when we were at Skybox, we um, took a look at the market, and we know the market for, you know, that the Wizards of the Coast has for d and is tech. It's mm -hmm. incredible. People love d and there's, there's millions of d and Um. It is one of the biggest things that 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 Hasbro talks about in their their annual, um, what do they call that? Their 
state of Hasbro document that they release once a year. They're they're going on about how how great D and D is. I keep thinking of Hasbro <laughs> Pulse, but no, that's their pseudo convention. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, but we know there's tons of players out there, but we also know that at the time that we were looking into this, there was only about 180, 200,000 people using virtual tabletops, like top. When you bring up the idea of using a virtual tabletop with other D&D players, sometimes you get kind of mixed feelings. Ah, we don't want to do that. We don't want to play online or, you know, we don't really need that gimmicky thing. Um, and like for my, for myself, like I play both online and in person, not much in person anymore, but when we played in person, we would go into a boardroom or sit into someone's living room and we would put roll 20 or D 20 pro up on the TV and we'd be sitting around eating chips and our battle map would be there. Right. And we would use this as a tool for our role playing game. And it was fantastic. It changed the way we played even our local game. Mm -hmm. So our vision for Mythic Table is to take that, that transformation of my own game and to put that out there for everybody and make it accessible for everybody. So people can be like, well, I'm going to try this in my living room and see what that's like. Mm -hmm. And be able to just pop it on their TV without any subscriptions or without any sign up. Um, you can just go in as a guest user and play around with it and see how it goes. Um, so that was that was our vision. Yeah, since you meant since you mentioned um, D and D, that does bring that does bring me to one thing that's a significant concern, specifically for, specifically for me and my and my table. Um, mm -hmm. And this was this is this has been a point of contention regarding other virtual tabletops, which I I mean no disrespect to to those other ones, they do great work, but um. I a lot of there's a lot of them that rely that rely on two two assumptions that don't work for me personally. The first is that I'm likely to be playing either D, either D and D or Pathfinder. And while I've got nothing against either of those games, um, because of the body of work that I cover. I can't just stick with those two games. In fact, when it, came, when it comes to my game reviews, I go out of my way to not focus on D&D 5th Edition or Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I'll get sometimes I'll get lucky in in say um roll in say roll 20 where somebody's set, done a API setup on the on the foundry as a, a third party thing. Mhm. Mm Sometimes I I am not so lucky, um, and I, and I have to try and finagle it myself. Which, given the given the way a given the way Roll Twenty's API scripting works, is um, easier said than done at times. Especially mm -hmm. if you're especially if you're dealing with a dice system that's unconventional, as I was with um, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Third Edition a few years back. Um, yeah, and. The, and the uh, the other issue that en that ends up happening is the assumption that I'm going to be using vanilla rule set, i.e., the exact same rule set that's in that's in the core book, the whole acronym of raw rules as written, with no house ruling or anything like that. When I can safely say, uh, unless I, unless I am guest GMing, I have never run a game raw in my life even if it's just tiny little tweaks here and there that's imp that's imp that's just improvisation i'm always house ruling yeah sometimes more than others like the ri the times that i've run riffs i had i i had a book of house rules that was so big it may as well have been a source book all in, all in of itself but I'm all, but I'm always, pu I'm always putting in some sort of hack, and sometimes the auto the automated calculations for a lot for a lot of virtual tabletops have difficulty accounting for for not for non-standard um, formula. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely a problem. Um, so I'm guessing that you're asking what Mythic Tables approach is. Yeah. 
Good. I'm glad you asked, actually. Um, we don't, we've got something in the works that's not quite public, um, but um, so we have a partnership right now with the Open Gaming Network. Mm -hmm. And the way this partnership came about was um, when I reached out to them to talk about something that we originally called ORAD, uh, but we're changing the, the name to like uh, o OGS or something like that. But what it is, is it's a... It's an open game system reference. Um, and the way it works is it allows you to specify in strict data, in, in simple data files, how your game system works. And the way that this makes, becomes really powerful with, um, with Mythic Table is that Mythic Table has, I mean, we haven't, we haven't accomplished this yet. But we're going to be using a data inheritance model that will allow you to, say, build a character sheet for whatever game, mm -hmm. and then inherit from that to build a goblin in that game, and then inherit from that goblin to build, say, a goblin chieftain in that game. But that same kind of data inheritance can be used on rule systems as well. And the way it works is that we can get publishers to publish their um, OGS reference, uh, which is basically just a open reference to you know the SRD that they have right now, or other minor publishers who who don't really want to gate their uh, their content, or they want to open up some of the content for BTT use. Mm -hmm. So they release this, and if you have a homebrew version of it, you can take that reference it, and then modify it in such a way that you're building your custom rules on top of their custom rules by changing one or two files um, in a really kind of simple way. All right, I got it. Um, so the partnership with OGN is a conversation of how do we do that with some of the more complicated rule systems out there? How do we do that with uh, the third-party content developers? who are making um, you know, alterations to systems or content for systems, uh, things like that. So it's a perfect partnership um, because they really understand the data uh, and the scope of the data. And we understand how to put it into a VT. And since, since you mentioned um... Since you mentioned dice, dice rules, that brings me to another question that I'm curious how you're addressing because um some of the games that I have that I have in my vast library use for 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 the sake for the sake of simplicity I'll refer to it as non-standard um resolution. Mm -hmm. In some cases this means using um using cards like like say um Dragonlance 3rd Age or the or the second Marvel TSR um RPG. Um mm -hmm. or you have instances where it's you where it's using dice, but it's not using um, numerical dice. Um, examples of this would be Fate, or um, Genesis, or um, the fifth edition of Legend of the Five Rings. Mm -hmm. um, how would would that be something that would be that that would be um, adaptable with what you have planned with Mythic? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Currently, our dice roller is pretty limited. Um, our dice roller is an implementation of an open source um, dice roller right now that has a lot of flexibility, but it doesn't have that doesn't have that flexibility to be able to um, innately handle uh, non numeric dice. So it's all numeric dice, mm -hmm. um, but we can build onto that system pretty easily, and we don't have it in our roadmap right now. But one of the things I'd really love to see is cards. And the reason why I want to see cards is because if we can do dice, tokens, and cards, we can almost do anything. Yeah. Anything. And we not only don't we don't just want to build a VTT that's a combat simulator. So we have ideas and plans running around about how do we make a system that's meant for a game like Fate. You know, what would a storyteller need to help tell his story 
when doing a system that doesn't have comp that's not a top-down kind of simulator that works with scenarios and scenes and sound and uh, NPCs, and dialogue and things like that. Be able to uh, put a put a scene on there that people would, you know, find online that is just like a, a landscape, and then have as you bring characters into the scene, have them be portraits that slide in from the side. Another one slides in from the side, and almost a, you know, almost like a, um, a simple Japanese RPG game. Yep. Now, Something like that. Possibilities are endless, really. Mm -hmm. um, I'd I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that um, Savage Worlds uses uses playing cards specifically for um and it for initiative. Um, now. That does bring that does bring me to another to another point that I've ha I've had some contention with when it comes to um when it comes to a lot of virtual tabletops and that is the fact that several of them it's very clear that they want that they want people to use um, battle maps that are that are specifically designed for them and when you try and when you try and import images to use as as battle maps. Even if the bat, even if the image has an actual grid, trying to get that to line up with the with the snap to grid on the virtual tabletop is well, not to put too fine a point on it, a dice roll. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. no matter what, there's always going to be some misalignment, no matter where you put it, no matter how much, no matter how many pixel differences there are, there's always something off. Mm-hmm. So one of the interesting things that we're doing right now is, and it's a little bit of a shame because the Kickstarter itself has been taking so much of my time that I haven't had an opportunity to go into the system and work on it. Um, but we've attracted um, a volunteer by the name of Kevin Cox, who I met on Reddit when he came out with this really crazy and interesting way of aligning grids to maps. Um, and if you do a Google search on Kevin Cox Grid Finder, you'll see what what he built. What he built. Mm -hmm. um, and we're in the process of implementing that for Mythic Table right now. And it's a really interesting take on this. But it's not going to solve the problem where your maps, which may have been taken from, say, a photograph or something like that, or they may be skewed in a certain way, have a, ver a varying level of what do you call it? Um, a varying level of grid sizes, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so there's ways that we can do that. Um, in, the, in the game industry, we use things like texture mapping to be able to pull uh, and, and manipulate the image in such a way that you can align it uh, and get the image to fit the uniformed, um, uniform grid. And another really interesting way to do it is to have a grid which is not uniform would be extremely difficult to do um, from a user experience uh, perspective. How do you basically say that we're going to skew the grid in this section? So it's going to be it's going to be a tricky one, but if we can get the momentum to build these things. We can eventually solve that. All right. Now, some now um, a com a common thing that's that some some people some people enjoy, especially in the crunch, and some people don't, is the tr is the tracking of effects, um, buffs, debuffs, mod modifiers, all all that jazz. Um, mm -hmm. Now, at the best of times, the tracking of this kind of thing is always a scub affair. Um, in some games, more than in some games, more than others, especially since these sort of buffs and debuffs are um, one could one could argue it one could argue is a cru is a crucial point with some narrativist games like Fate. But what I'm cu what I'm curious about is what is what tools Mythic is going to offer when it comes to tracking these kind of things more e more easily and more effectively. So we have an idea of a of a modifier system that we're going to put in place that uh, allows you to both visualize, 
track and manipulate uh, buffs that have been put onto individual characters or tokens. Mm -hmm. um, and they can be controlled by time, they can be controlled by proximity, they can be controlled by all kinds of, of different little elements that trigger their creation and destruction. Um, plus, they can be used to modify all kinds of different systems in the game as well. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, we're still really at our early stage of this. We haven't even written one line of code for this system yet. Um, we just have plans for it. And the plans are basically, um, I guess the, the best way to explain it is they're inspired by games like World of Warcraft and things like that, mm -hmm. where buffs are a pretty big part of the experience. And being able to see and understand your buffs at a glance is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say I'd say I'd say it's also I'd say it's also important for cer for certain builds in pl in plenty of fantasy games. There's always there's always the um, I like to call them spoiler builds, who or the or the more or the more support builds. You know, what you know the kind of thing that the bard is supposed to be when he's not sucking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I no. The bard can the bard can not suck. I just I just like poking fun at the bard. Um, <laughs> the bard's a great example of this. Yeah. Like, ideally, this is it. so. We're going to use Pathfinder as an example here because the Pathfinder bard is still pretty simple. It has the area of effect mm -hmm. um, global buff that it gives to all of his allies. So that is a toggle for the player. He thinks of it as, oh, I'm either singing or I'm not singing. So we want that experience to be the exact same in the VTT. So you can see at a glance whether your character is singing or whether he's not singing. Now, for all the other allies on the field, they shouldn't have to change their character at all. If they're an ally of the player. Um, then that buff should automatically apply to their character, and they should be able to see it too in their, in their list of buffs or on the character token itself. Um, so that's that's a pretty important thing to us. All right. Um, now, since you mentioned a since you mentioned AOE, um, and you've kind you kind of hinted that you that you're planning on having methods to tr to track um, AOE AOE distance. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing that I'm curious about is if is if you ha if you have plans to implement something akin to to um, fog of war i know one of the more yeah. famous features of the of the pro subscription for D, for um roll 20 is dynamic lighting but i'm well, i'm well aware that something like dynamic lighting would be would would be a um would be a tricky thing would be a tricky thing to implement at the best of times it's to be honest with you, the dynamic lighting and the way it can be done is is not. I mean, it is it is a tricky thing, especially when you get into the different light modes and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, also, when you start getting into trying to define a really nice user experience with how to manage light sources in your. Scene. So we're not going to uh, we're not going to commit to that just yet, but we are committing to a fog of war system for our very first goal of the Kickstarter. So that if you take a look at the features that we're trying to kick out for that first goal, you'll see the fog of war in there. Yeah. I think you'll see the fog of war in there. It might be in the last Now you mentioned you mentioned how your partnership with the Open Gaming Network got started, but how how did you get in contact with um, World Anvil and how and how is the um how is the connection between Mythic Table and World An and World Anvil the um, integration going to work as far as what you so, have planned? So the World Anvil one is really exciting for us. Um, that one came out of the blue. Um, I think in my early days when um, we were launching the first playable, well, not early days, oh, I think maybe six months ago, something like that, I reached out to a number of different people and I reached out to... Um, World Anvil, and they responded with just a little hi, welcome to the community kind of thing, mm -hmm. which is nice. Um, but then um, a couple months ago, we were we were just finalized our plan for the kicks. 
and we're getting in the process of writing our scripts and doing all that. Got a, an email, woke up to an email from them because they're in, they're over in Europe, I believe. Um, so we got an email from them. They, uh, they said they wanted to have a quick chat. So I hopped on the phone with them eight o'clock in the morning and we chatted and, um, we had such a great chemistry between like the three of us. It was Janet, Dimitri and myself. Um, and we found that, um, we like, we, we have so much in common and we just really like the way we're doing, they're doing business and the way mythic table is doing business. And we just, we just meshed really well. Mm-hmm. So we said, what can we do to enable, uh, world anvil content in mythic table? Um, they didn't really have any plans of making a VTT and they kind of felt that that was, you know, a direction that they really wanted to go. So they wanted to partner with us in hopes that we could find a way to use their existing APIs to get map content into Mythic Table. So we threw out our Mythic Table, our, our, our Kickstarter plans, and we rebuilt everything with this new partnership. So one of our goals here, one of our stretch goals is if we can make it, we're going to try to integrate with World Anvil in such a way that you can pull in a map that you make in World Anvil into Mythic Table. And has that has that been ha, is that sort of integration some, something that's been easy to work with, or is it something that that um has had its obstacles? So um, so far, we've just done the initial investigations. Um, we're taking a look at how we're going to do authentication between the two systems. And we're taking a look at their existing APIs. And we've had some feedback. And Dimitri, on their side, has been really receptive to that feedback. And we've, he's already been thinking about ways to improve some of the APIs to make it easier for a third-party service to integrate uh, with their system as opposed to a client program working with their system. Um, so we're going to make some changes to the way they do authentication. Um, and then we're going to, I think we're probably just going to use one of their existing map APIs. Um, but from the documentation, it looked like that map API was pretty new. But to be honest, we don't really need that much. Mm-hmm. We don't really need that much at all. All right, I got you. Um, shifting to dice systems for a moment, there is one. There is one approach with dice systems that I um, would be remiss if I didn't ask about, because I've already I've already covered um, I've already covered strict strict um, for, formula based approaches. But another but another one that I feel I'd need to ask about is um, hits based ones, where it's not it's not about a total number. It's about um, successes over a threshold. Um, mm-hmm. Two big examples that come to mind for this kind of thing is World of Darkness and Shadowrun. Yeah. I.e. five pounds of D6s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we, uh, we support that already with our existing open source implementation. It is a little weird, I believe, in the way that you have to set up the formula. Um, and we've fallen, we've, we've dropped the ball a little bit on how to make that easy for people to understand. And the reason for that is because this was simply a release for our, our first playable. And we were just happy getting people rolling dice, period, let alone doing these complicated, complicated, uh, things. So we need to improve the visibility and user experience around how people do some complicated things with their dice. And we have some ideas on how to do that. The last thing we want, the last thing we want is people reading a help document and then typing in these complex formulas. So we want to build a user experience that walks people through like, oh, what kind of dice roll are you trying to make? Mm-hmm. And then once they built that dice roll, be able to either reuse it or modify it in a meaningful way that they don't have to go through that every time. You mentioned it being weird. Are, are we talking weird in terms of you have, having to write a whole lot more text that might not be as... um as friendly on the eye test yeah yeah that's exactly right like some of it for example uh we can do advantage and disadvantage so in order to roll advantage 
um, in this system, you, you type in 1d20 AD. In order to roll disadvantage, you type in 1d20 DA. And that's the easiest one to remember. Absolutely the simplest and easiest one to remember. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things like exploding dice, dice pools, um, you know, critical success, critical of uh, critical failures and things like that, that can all be put into this dice roller. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, project uh, that this, that we're using for this. That's we... very, very sophisticated, but it's complicated. The way you describe it, I could e I could easily see the Boone and Bane system in Shadow of the Demon Lord being a bit complicated in the current setup. How does how does that one work? If you don't mind me asking. Um. It it's I one way I could describe it is a more controlled version of advantage disadvantage, whereas advantage disadvantage does the whole um, roll two d twenty and keep the highest or the or the lowest respectively. Boon and Bane, the way the way that it works is, you're either you're obviously the two will cancel each other out, but if you ro if you have to roll say a d if you have to roll say a d20 with a boot with a um, boon, um, you would roll you would roll a, you would roll that d20 and then roll a d6 and add that d6 to the result. Um, if you had to, if it was two boons, you would roll two d6s and keep the higher um, d6. To, and add that to the result, and oh. with, with Bane's, obviously, it's the opposite. Huh. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think I think we can do that with the existing system, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Easy. But it would be a really complicated formula. Mm -hmm. Um. I will admit that once one system that might that I could see. Um, having the assumption of being complicated, but would be rather easy to do, would be the um, would be the yin yang die that's used in feng shui. Um, hmm. The approach that that has is you've got a, you've got a black die and you've got a white die, and it's it's x minus y, and that's how that's how you get your results. If you if you get if you get a if you get a match, that's considered a critical. Oh, cool. Um, and it's it, and it's meant to take that kind of approach because obviously with a name like Feng Shui, it's try, it's trying to aim for that um, Hong Kong action feel, to the point where the creator of the game made a um, side book called "Blowing Up the Movies." <laughs> nice. But I think I think that would just be a a simple um, D six minus D six, or or something to that extent. Yeah, maybe. Maybe, but then to track the fact that a critical happened when they matched, like it's a critical on a zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, it'd be interesting to try. Yeah, and uh, obviously, once again, I'm vastly simplifying the matter. It's just, it's just there's a there's a whole lot of variety in how in how to and how to um how to hand how to handle task resolution based on the game in based on the game in question and. Then there's the then there's the whole issue of how of what how do you guys plan on tracking um, limited resource effects whether it be spell whether it be spell charges in Pathfinder or um, the skill pools in um, Gumshoe. Mm -hmm. So one of the really great things that we've been able to do um, from the beginning is the way that we treat. Um, I'm going to call them documents or objects, um, but basically any any piece of data in the game. The way we treat uh, modifications to those, we came out really, really early and said, we don't know what, how these objects are going to look. We don't know what the structure is. We don't know what the scheme is. We don't want people making huge edits to these documents and causing the entire thing to be re-uploaded every single time. So we came up with a really interesting way of doing discrete modifications um, to these documents in a very flexible way mm -hmm. so that um, you can describe, if you can describe your, uh, if you can describe the 
character system or whatever in one of these documents, which uses basically arrays and dictionaries of, of, of data, you can modify them, have them distributed to all the other clients and everything is kept in sync. So this document backing up things like um, spell books or uh, mana pools or things like that mm. makes it extremely easy for us to be able to manage. We don't have to change a thing on the server. We, um, we can make a client-only character sheet that's available that tracks something like this. Um, and currently, we have the idea of maps, tokens, characters, players, things like that that are stored in these objects. Mm -hmm. But we could store anything um, in another game system that comes out could, in fact, have a mana pool uh, resource that's available. It could be owned by one player. It could be owned by the entire group. And it can be manipulated in any way and then just visualized in any way. Now, so it's pretty possible. When now, in the um, in the example in the example gifts the uh, mockups that we that we see here, we have we have the usual um, usual kind of symbol based approach as well as a representative of health. Um, mm -hmm. Though something something I'm curious about is how, is would the system be able to handle a um, setup that has that has multiple health tracks like say um, the cipher system? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the idea is that the representation of that token on the board mm -hmm. is going to be controlled by a um, by a game system specific um, component. Mm -hmm. And as we introduce more game systems, um, there'll be more components available. Uh, we can do that by any number of things. We can make a very flexible character that allows you to toggle on and off a number of different options. Or we can allow people to define their own characters um, by checking out our repository, making a change, and checking it back in. It's a bit of an advanced um, use case right there. Mm -hmm. Not everyone's going to be able to do that. But the people who, who want to be able to do that kind of thing, they want to be able to make a new game system, um, we're going to work really hard to make sure that they understand how it works and that they feel that they can have the power to be able to make the things that they want. That's the power of being open source. At this point. Which I, Unlike, I, mm, sorry, go ahead. I can, I can see, I can see that, especially since this is, this is the reason why I focused on these kind of systems, because when you're, when you're dealing with something that's open source, you're um inviting you're inviting people to come in and find new ways to um to see what to see how it ticks you know you're basically giving people the old blue, the old um blue bucket of legos that we all had as kids exactly exactly now so oh sorry go ahead when when it come when it come so when it comes to I think it. I think it's safe to say that the whole the whole using D, using um, D and D as the as the primary assumption isn't necessarily a factor with um, Mythic. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, in fact, um, we actually. I mean, we want to make sure that the people playing D and D can use Mythic Table, mm -hmm. um, but we don't want to marry ourselves with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that's very important to us. Um, and the reason we don't want to do that um, is there's basically two reasons. One is that the uh, with D&D &D Beyond and Foundry and all these other VTTs that are doing a great job with D&D &D, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, um, we feel like this that may not be where we're best suited. But we also want to make sure that when we say we treat people first, we want to make sure that we cover everybody. We're not going to alienate anybody who has a special way of playing or has a special game that they want to be able to. So it's just a matter of time 
um, for us to be able to uh, enable these game systems. Especially since it sounds it sounds like you you want you're um, trying to avoid the assu the assumption I mentioned earlier of people just playing um, vanilla, especially when there's exactly. a dearth of um, very interesting um, th um, third party third party material. Most re the most recent example being the expansions done with um, Fate Forge. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, with that kind of thing, in, with that kind of thing in mind, so you you've um, you've got at the time of this recording, you've got thirty one days till the till the end of it. Um, I do want to congratulate you on the progress that you've made that you made thus far, and in order to make sure I don't jinx, there we go. Look, <laughs> you you should you should know just as well as I do about about why, about why you don't tempt why you don't tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> yeah, and es exactly. And especially, especially the fact that R and Jesus doesn't like you, or anybody. Yep, it's true. So, in a lot of times when I get a lot of times when I go into this seg this segment, I usually ask the the release window or something like that. But since this is open source and it's going to be continuously developed, um, that's a moot point, obviously. So, talk to me about the roadmap that you guys. Have in, have in mind for the coming months. Sure, absolutely. Um, so, what we are hoping to do, and now if we if we make this Kickstarter, we're going to do this. If we don't make the Kickstarter, we're still going to do this. This is the great thing about Mythic Table. Um, we're going to go in this direction regardless. However. One of the reasons why we're kind of a little iffy about the Kickstarter is because we have a month by month planning thing. Mm -hmm. And the way that works is we'll gather feedback from the community uh, for an entire month. We put all of this together. And when we plan for the next month, we take that into account. So we can be very agile. We can be going one direction and then all of a, all of a sudden switch and go another direction. The Kickstarter, on the other hand, is putting us on the hook for six to 12 months of work. Um, and that's fine. That's fantastic. Uh, if we make the Kickstarter, it's great. We're going to hire a couple of our volunteers who have been working really, really hard for us already for nothing. And we're going to give these guys, you know, a paycheck, basically. Um, but our current roadmap, as defined by the Kickstarter, and I hope we keep going in this direction, um, is going to be the very first thing is going to be enabling sharing. So the very first step to integrate both the marketplace from the OGN and the map uh, integration from, from World Anvil is to build a system that allows us to share content between users. That's going to be a system that allows you to search, a system that allows you to import or transfer or copy. Um, there's going to be some improvements to our, our game master tools. Uh, we're going to work on things like token visibility. Um, these are some things that the community has really been asking for, and we just kind of slipped. But the big one, the, like the big one that I really want to do is the map improvements. And we've already started this. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, the, the grid experience. Um, this is defining a composite map system so we can put multiple images on the same map and do things that we can kind of already do in other virtual tabletops that make them really powerful. We want to do the same thing. Um, so that's our that's basically our first goal for the, the Kickstarter. And I think that really that defines the direction that we really want to go in, I think. I, I, can, cer I can certainly get that. Um, with that, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to brave the hell of time zones and come all the way up here to the temple. My and, pleasure, absolutely. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Mildred. I really appreciate it. Yep. 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!